So now the judge says guilty. What's the first thought in your mind? Myself, should I, you know, should I kill myself? My name is um, Sunday Moses. Um, a lot of my friends call me Sunny um, or Sean. Um, Brooklyn, New York, Four Green Projects. Wrongfully convicted, was exonerated in um, 2018. Um, I served 18 and a half years for a murder and a shooting of four other people. So I'm now, I'm, I'm, I'm here today, uh, living my life and uh, trying to kind of like do things to fix the system. Sonny Moses finally returned home Tuesday I'm night home, after man. spending nearly 18 years in prison for a crime he said he didn't commit. <laughs> the 37 year old was accused of shooting and killing a four year old girl nearly 20 years ago in Brooklyn. I was raised here, you know, it was a different Fort Greene. I haven't been in here in a minute either. I seen a guy get killed by him. It's dad. In this apartment, the guy that lived there, he used to sell drugs, and I was small, kind of little at the time, and Police came up here. I heard a lot of noise from my door, and I looked up. Police had raided this house, and that was like the first time I seen anything like that. And I never forgot it because it was traumatizing. They bust in the door, and then they had like his grandmother, his mother. They had the kids. They had them all lined up right there on their knees. They had an old lady on their knees like that. While all the police was flooded up in there, and I was looking through my peephole. And this is the building I got arrested. The um, homicide detectives came to this building. I never seen uh, the streets again. 18 and a half years. The projects changed a lot. The demographics changed a lot. Right here, where there was a playground. This is downtown Brooklyn, so so you know a lot of court buildings, you know shopping centers. Everything is here. It was notorious for the violence um, when crack hit, but a lot of guys used to hang right here on the checkerboards. And I watched a lot of things happen right from these benches. And so now it's, you know, a lot of Asians live here, some white people. This is what they call Myrtle Avenue, AKA Murder Avenue. Video game room that was owned by a friend of mine's grandfather. And that was there for years. That they took that. That's changed. This is where the original 50 Cent, um, not the rapper, but um, the street figure. Um, this is the projects that he's from, and this, you know, where he ran that in the 80s. And a lot of other notorious people that ran around here. These are the people that I grew up under and watching and seeing and things like that. In 1995, there was um, a award show. It was. Source Awards, um, Source Magazine, which was a hip hop publication, um, was having an award show, and it was in New York. Um, this was memorable because um, at the time, East Coast, West Coast thing was just starting to bubble up. Um, and at this particular award show, um, Shug Knight, who was the CEO um, of, of Death Row, got on stage and made a reference to um, Sean Combs, who's now known as Diddy. There was a guy um, from his neighborhood who, who attended that award show. And allegedly, this guy robbed um, an individual at that award show for um, um, a Rolex watch and some jewelry. And, and that individual ended up getting the guy from this neighborhood killed because of that. And so because of that, the guy who got killed, his name was um, Killer Ben. Um, um, his real name was Benjamin O'Gara, and allegedly he was alleged to have done these things, and this is why he was killed. That murder um, sparked sort of a war because he, you know, he was well known, and he, he, he had people that wanted revenge and wanted to get revenge for his, for his death as well. As a result of that, there was a lot of shootings. Uh, it was crazy around that time. There was a lot of shootings. A lot of people was killed, a lot of people were shot. And 
during one of those incidents, um, a four-year-old girl by the name of Shimon Johnson, may she rest in peace, was murdered, was killed. Um, four other people were shot in that incident. Because a little girl was killed, it sort of like um, enraged the community, and rightfully so. Um, and so and it was all over the papers and they wanted to get the perpetrators. It was around election time, so you know how it get around election time when um, law enforcement is and, and politicians are trying to uh, make an impression that they're tough on crime. I know about the incident because the incident was it happened in a, it was it was happening like people was getting shot every day every week, so it was already in the paper. You know, I was young at the time and I was in the street. I was like, you know, 18, 19 years old. I was hustling carrying guns and stuff like that. And so that happened, but I wasn't a part of it, so I really didn't think that much about it other than, you know, that you know that's messed up and, you know, I'm looking at it like everybody else did. A week after the little girl was, was, was killed, homicide detectives appeared at my apartment. You know, I was sleeping, and my, my sister opened the door for them and they came inside my room, barged in and came inside my room with their guns out and they searched me while I was asleep looking for guns. So I woke up feeling hands on me and it's detective, two men with suits on. And they woke me up and said, get up. You know, we want to talk to you. We do want to talk to you down at the precinct. So I'm like, for what? They like, we tell you when we get down to the precinct. You know, keep in mind, I don't know what they talking about. And then, and I'm in, the, I'm in the street. So I'm thinking maybe, I don't know, maybe they coming to me for something that I did, maybe. I don't know. But I'm not thinking, the first thing from my mind is that I killed somebody. They take me to the precinct. When I get in the precinct, they sit me down. And then they tell me what I'm there for. Oh, um, you know, we're investigating, you know, a murder that happened in um, Brownsville, Brooklyn. Because that's where the crime happened at. It didn't happen in this neighborhood. It didn't happen in my neighborhood. Um, and so when they said that, I, you know, I was like, I reacted like anybody else would react who didn't do a crime. Mm -hmm. You know, you would be like, okay, you know, you probably would make you a little bit more relieved. You yeah. know, like, all right, I'm not, you know, they I telling me, asking me about something that I wouldn't know I wasn't there. That's, that was my attitude. They start asking me all these questions about, do you know this person? Do you know that person? Where was you at on this day, this time? That, so keep in mind that I know I didn't do it, so I'm telling them where I was at. So they kind of had in their mind like I was the person who did it. And then they asked me, did I know a particular individual who I did know? Why they asked me, do I, do I know this person? And that person has nothing to do with anything. Lo and behold, come to find out, this person went and told them that I did it. And they, they didn't ask anything else. I found out later this guy went and told homicide detectives that I was the one that did it. So, that's how they ended up coming to me. Literally hours are going by and I'm telling them where I was at, where I didn't do it, we going back and forth. And then at, at, at one point, um, there was a detective um, who now became disgraced. That's when he came into the room and that's when it kind of, the interview kind of went left and went sideways from that point on. That's ridiculous. That is totally ridiculous. With an attorney by his side at 68 years old, Detective Louis Scarcella repeatedly said in Brooklyn Supreme Court he couldn't remember every detail from an investigation two decades ago. They start jumping me, like police smacked me, start choking me. They was holding me down. You know, he trying to, um, trying to kick me in my in my testicles. At that point, you, they act, they're not acting like detectives anymore. They're not, you're not acting like, you're not investigating a crime, you're, you're criminals. I get picked out of a lineup and I get arrested. Um, I go to trial. Um, I end up losing trial. And I was sentenced to um, 15 of life. You know, I always say that I was blessed, you know, that you know, no real harm came to me while I was on Mike's Island. But for the for the two years that I was there, you know, I witnessed a lot of violence from the prisoner side of it and from the correctional side of it, you know. 
and it was deplorable from the correctional side, right? Because you're housing criminals, so you probably would expect criminal behavior. But you don't expect criminal behavior from law enforcement. I was there when that whole, when the whole blood thing was like being um, formed and stuff like that, you know. Um, you know, I was even there, you know, because not just from this case, I was on Rikers Island prior to that. When I was 16, I got arrested um, for a gun. That first time, I only was on Rikers Island for like 90 days, right? Um, this time, I'm on Rikers Island for a murder, and it's much longer. I didn't have a paid lawyer as I was fighting this case. Um, I had an 18B. I actually, you know, because I'm so naive, at the time, I'm so naive. I actually, even though this happened, but I actually had a lot of faith in the system and that they would figure out that I wasn't the one that did it. Because at the time, I, I didn't understand how you could take a person who was not somewhere that didn't do anything and just say that they did something and was in the place that they was never at ever. Don't know the people or nothing. Like, at this time, I've never heard of that. I never, I didn't even never hear of that. Usually, I didn't hear, you know, I've heard about people being arrested wrongfully and even wrongfully convicted. But in this sense, um, three friends go to a party and one of the friends do something mm -hmm. and all of them, it was, it was more like that. Like, the people they saying I shot, I don't even know. I never shot, didn't see them. The place that, that, they, that, that they, they were saying I was at, I never been there. The people who saying that they saw me did it, I don't know them, never saw them. The lawyer is saying, he's not saying take a deal, he's saying let's go to trial, but I was adamant about going to trial. They made me out to be this young, wild animal that just went and shot up all these people. So even though I didn't do it, they didn't give me no bail. The disorientation that you feel from the flash bomb, right? going off, boom, and you just disoriented. That's the best way I probably could describe it. Like, it was like, it was like a flash bomb. Like, like you don't know what to think. So, so my mind was definitely, I was definitely disoriented um, um, for a second. I'm not even gonna lie, for a second, this was a little bit later, like, when I went back to Rikers Island, you know, like, I like, you know, I, I asked myself, should I, you know, should I kill myself? I'm like, wow. I don't know how much time I'm gonna get. All I know is that I got a, I'm charged with a homicide of the killing of a four-year-old girl and shooting four other people. She caught a stroke. Mm -hmm. My mom's caught a stroke, so you know she was stressed out behind it. It had a big, a real, a real effect on my family. You know what I'm saying? Some people were saying, "Oh, he did it. Oh, he should, he should, he should." He should rot in jail. Some people were like, yo, he should get the death penalty. The day I was arrested for this crime was the day that they reinstated the death penalty in New York. So, at this point, it's like you also facing the death penalty because I also had a co-defender who they said I did it with. And they said it was two of us shooting. So, so they wanted me to um, say that he did it you know, which I didn't do, and I ended up getting sentenced. I told him about the cop, you know, I said, you know, this cop in here, he forced me to say that I did it, and I really didn't do it, and they beat me up in the precinct, so on and so forth, and, you know, this is where I was at when I did it, so on and so forth, but you gotta remember, it's, it's emotional for a lot of people, because it's a four-year-old girl that was murdered, mm -hmm. and that's what they thought about me, you know what I'm saying? It was a shooting, a little girl got murdered, and then here's the news saying that we got the team who did it. You watch the news and you see a crime that shocks your conscience, right? Like I don't know about recently, um, a guy was killed walking with his daughter, right? That shocks the conscience. When you turn on the news, you see that, that shocks the conscience. So, the next image, if the following week, they say, we got the guy that killed that man that was walking with his daughter. Your mind kind of naturally doesn't go to maybe he didn't do it. Mm -hmm. Your mind almost says, you know what, he needs to rot. There's a heavy emphasis on racism in our legal system.
and I and in law enforcement, there's a heavy influence in that. But I don't want to attribute every wrongful conviction or every wrongful arrest to racism. Um, it's also the fact that um, a prosecutor or a detective didn't do their job properly. I was in all the violent prisons upstate. Because again, remember, I'm 19, so I'm growing up in jail. Coming from the street, I'm growing up, right? So I still have a lot of immaturity in me. I'm smart, right? But I'm in an environment, it's, it's a couple of dynamics that's working. I'm locked up for something I didn't do, I'm trying to get out of jail, right? But then I have to deal with what's going on day to day in prison, right? The gang activity is flourishing crazy like this. Bloods are growing by the day. And it's wild, people getting cut every day. You know, um, I was in C73, you know, I was in HDM, um, those, uh, you know, big buildings and things that happened in C74, C95. I managed to surround myself with a group of individuals that we would protect each other, right? At all costs. It's heartbreaking to think when you take somebody that's innocent and the mind that you have to put yourself in, the zone that you have to put yourself in in order to survive on Rikers Island. And in prison, period. If you're labeled a snitch, if you're labeled a punk, you know what I'm saying? If you're labeled as someone that's easy, you know, just, the, you know, you don't want that, you don't want that tag with you, especially mm. if, you know, if you're there for a short period of time, maybe you can fly under the radar and go home. But I was on, I was there for a murder. So I might go to a certain dorm or a certain cell block and it's 30 bloods in there. What makes you not join? Because I, I, all, um, I always had a leader's mind. And I didn't feel comfortable with what I saw. If you blood and I'm um, your superior, if I say do something, whether you agree with it or not, if you don't do it, you are going to get cut or stabbed or jumped. And that idea never sat well with me. You had correctional officers that was blood, or you had correctional officers that was Latin King. You had female correctional officers that was Latin Queen. Like, it was crazy. Ray Kwan, the purple tape, um, Wu-Tang, his, his tape was real, Wu-Tang had already took off, but his particular tape had, was real popular at the time I got locked up. Biggie first album, I wasn't in the street for yeah, none of crazy. those albums. Yeah, not even Reasonable Doubt. Not even Reasonable Doubt. Tupac get killed, I was on, um, Rikers Island. I, was, I ain't gonna lie, I was hurt. I was I was gonna hurt I went to school with Biggie. 9-11, I remember laying down. I was upstate, I was laying down and the, and, the, and the guy came to me and said, yo, man, you know, yo, the towers, somebody just hit the towers. And I, I for some reason, I was sleeping. I didn't even really gauge the um, the gravity of what he was saying until I, until I got up. Did we think we would ever see a black president? And I remember everybody saying no. Technology made leaps and bounds, and that's something that I'm still learning today. Remember, I'm 19, so I didn't know a lot. I didn't know how to drive. I didn't have nothing. I never paid bills myself, nothing, filed taxes. So these are things that I'm learning, and I'm learning it with technology. I didn't have sex for a long time, you know, while in prison and stuff like that. And I've seen a lot of people engage in homosexual activity. You're living in an abnormal environment, right? Because you have 18 and a half years of not, of existing without a female counterpart. Some people begin messing with other men. I never engaged in any homosexual activity, although um, there were incidences where um, other men in prison would, would hint at it. Because I'm young, you know, I'm young, I'm 19 and I'm in jail. You know, somebody had to tell me. You know that guy right there that you talking to is, is gay, you know. I think I was in Bear Hill Correction Facility and at this point um, I had about maybe like 16 and a half years in or something like that. So one day I called home and I called my mother and I said, and she said, you know, I think the cop that locked you up is, um, 
is in a newspaper for, for, for some other stuff. So I said, yeah, what's his, what's his name? She couldn't really remember that. I said, send me the article. She told me. So when she sent me the article, I said, yeah, that's him. Right, his name is Louis Garcella. I said, that's him. The article read that they reopening 50 of his homicide cases. So I wrote the court. And I wrote um, the New York Post. And the court said, well, he was involved in your case. They wrote me a letter back saying that he was involved in your case and we opened up an investigation looking into your case. I wrote a lawyer. My lawyer's name is Mr. Ron Kuby, one of the best in the business. He wrote me back and told me to give me his, send me his trial transcripts. My mother, my family took it to him. He took my case pro bono. I ended up going to the parole board and admitting to the crime. And the reason why I admitted to the crime is because the parole board um, will deny parole if you don't admit to the crime. Whether you're innocent or not, it doesn't matter. Um, they just want you to take responsibility for the crime. Um, which I wrestled with for years because I didn't want to admit to a crime that I didn't commit. But in order to get out of prison, I would have to admit to the crime. And they still deny parole because they don't have to let you go. I got life. So they still deny parole. So then they gave me two years and then I had to go back. And but between me going back, that's when the case broke. And then in between that, the, the guy who testified against me, um, he wrote a letter saying that he lied on me to the parole board to help to help get my release. I remember leaving um, Bear Hill Correctional Facility, which is all like on the border of Canada. Um, so it was far, you know what I'm saying? My, my lawyers came and picked me up from jail and they drove me all the way back here. New York City and um, Brooklyn. I remember when I got in the car, I was happy, it was snow all over the place. And I was just thinking like, like damn, I made it out. Like, because there was times during the course of my bid where I didn't feel like I was gonna come home. Now the parole board questions his conviction after the Brooklyn District Attorney's Office launched an investigation into the detective in charge of the case. Moses' case is one of more than 50 being reopened after investigators discovered that Detective Louis Scarcella coached witnesses and allegedly tried to frame another man for murder in 1991. Although Moses has not been fully cleared for the murder, his attorneys expect him to be exonerated. I acclimate myself back to how to use a phone. Like, I didn't know nothing. Places change, you know what I'm saying? Blocks change, trains change. Every, literally every part of society change but keep in mind I'm still on parole I'm still on parole and I'm still fighting my case it took me four and a half years to be exonerated before. when I came home in 2013 and that's what I mean if, you know the fight was hard because 2013 I didn't get exonerated to 2018 parole released me from prison but that doesn't mean that the, that the Kings County District Attorney's Office was going to drop the charges. According to him, he didn't do anything wrong. Um, you know, he lied about the whole situation. So, so, but you know, my lawyer did a good job in um, in exposing those lies and showing, you know, how it was like the likelihood of me um, committing that crime um, didn't happen. Not to mention. The real perpetrator, uh, the real perpetrator stepped up and said that he did it and that, that I didn't do it. And the cousin of the victim, the little girl, um, also said that he lied. But see, the thing is, he had got acquitted for the murder. So he couldn't be tried again because of double jeopardy. He did it. It was two shooters and one driver. They said it was three of us in the car. The driver never got out the car, but they said the two shooters did, which was allegedly me and this individual. The individual, which is my co-defendant, he shot himself during that incident. And so he was arrested inside the hospital. So they caught him the same day. I was arrested a week later because somebody else said that I was with him. I know both of them. Okay. And the one who said that 
when the police started investigating and the police went to, 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 to him and said, well, how do you know he was dead? He said, because somebody told me. Instead of saying, you know what, we got his name because of hearsay, they, they didn't. They took my name and they kept going with it and just took it to the witnesses and made them loud. me. I sued the city and the state, and so my case is pending right now. A very hefty um, um, suit, and it's and it's um, and it's one that um, I'm confident that we'll win. That's the sad part about it because um, while you wait, life still goes on. Um, so me, I've taken out loans and stuff like that because I've been exonerated, mm -hmm. but it still was two shooting. Mm -hmm. So the person who 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 was supposed to be me, they never got. The cop did all of these things and they refused to prosecute him. Um, it's been proven now that um, he had a hand in over 15 people being wrongfully convicted, including me. He hasn't been um, convicted. He hasn't been arrested. He hasn't even been questioned uh, by an independent um, um, review board on his activities in these cases. Because he collects a pension even after he's done all these things, even after it's proven that he's done these things. I think that they're afraid that if they um, press the situation too much with him and put him into a situation where he would have to testify about his activities as a homicide detective, that he would then turn around and uncover a bigger corruption with people who were complicit in the things that he was doing. It would be like opening, opening Pandora's box. Right? And there's a popular saying that says the system would never indict itself. This is not a, a, a detective that was a nobody. He was on a Dr. Phil show. He was in the GQ magazine. So he, he, he celebrated. He was given a gold shield. Are there rules when it comes to homicides? No, no, there are none. I will do whatever I have to do within the law to get a confession. I stated there were no rules, but I operated under the law. Today, he said he caught suspects in around 160 murders in his career. Do you stand by all the investigations you've conducted? 110 percent. What I aim to do is show um, the corruption in the system and how they protect those type of people and how even to today, after doing 18 and a half years and being home after six and a half years, that um, there still exists um, that same sort of corruption that's going to protect people like him and allow him to continue to collect the pension, although he's done these things to all of these people. I've never had a relationship with the victim's family. A particular incident affected not only me, but them as well, because you still have a four-year-old girl that's not coming back. In 1995, she was four years old, so yes, she would be a young lady, and, and I never want that to sort of slip by the even that they're real victims on both sides. It's a public safety issue. Mm -hmm. Because for everybody, for every wrongful conviction, right, the real perpetrator goes on to go free mm -hmm. and commit another crime. Mm -hmm. You lock up the wrong rapist, you double impacted the problem. Mm -hmm. Because now you lock up somebody that's innocent and you still didn't, this person that you, <laughs> is still out there raping. So you didn't really do nothing except lock up somebody that's innocent. We feel that all interrogations should be recorded um, from beginning to end. Agreed. And anything less shouldn't be accepted. You know, just move on with my life. I have a son. I have a son that's about to be 19. I'm excited to finally be in his life. I was locked up almost his whole life.